Good day. <clears throat> I'm continuing to uh, have a discussion about the 12 days of Christmas. Missed yesterday because, partly because it was Sunday and I just never uh, was able to get back home and do it uh, because of some other things that were going on. But um, back on track today, and this is the third day of Christmas. And you know, there's 12 days uh, extend from December 25th to January 6th which is the Feast of the Epiphany, which officially ends the Christmas season. As you heard me say, Christmas is a season and not a day. And so that's why we're doing these as we uh, continue to look at the important text. Now, we're going to look at the Gospel of John. Yeah, uh, the first day, we looked at the passage from Matthew in which Jesus is identified as Emmanuel, quoting from Isaiah 7.14, which means God with us. So that's Matthew's way of describing it. As I pointed out, uh, also that day, um, uh, uh, the, the passages in the Gospel of Matthew kind of highlight that. What does it mean to have God with us? Well, Jesus says, whenever two or more are gathered in my name, I am right there in your midst. And then on his parting words, the very end of the Gospel of Matthew 28, uh, 19 and 20, he says, Go therefore into all the world, making disciples of every nation, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded with you, uh, commanded you, and lo, I am with you always to the end of the age. So we have this notion of God with us. This is a theme that takes place in the Gospel of Matthew. Uh, today we're going to turn to the Gospel of St. John. <clears throat> fourth gospel, we think the last gospel to be written. Uh, coincidentally, today is December 27th, and this is the holy day, the feast day for St. John. And so our collect for this evening is the collect for that feast day. Let us pray. Shed upon your church, O Lord, the brightness of your light, that we, being illumined by the teaching of your apostle and evangelist, John, may so walk in the light of your truth that at, at length we may attain to the fullness of eternal life. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. So we turn to the Gospel of John. John is a very different gospel than the other three. We call the first three Gospels synoptic Gospels because they're very similar and the idea of synoptic is seeing it with one eye. The Gospel of John is different. In particular, if you want to just talk about the setting, the setting for the Gospel of John tends to be in Judea. It's not to say they never are in uh, Galilee. But in contrast to that, the first three Gospels, the setting is in Galilee. And only in the last week of Jesus' life does he make the trip, the pilgrimage, to Jerusalem, to the Passover festival, where he then um, encounters the problems with the religious leaders, and he's crucified, and then, of course, gloriously resurrected on that Sunday, <clears throat> first day of the week. In the Gospel of John, there is this incredible passage. Um, it's as good as anything in the whole of the Scripture. The first 18 verses of chapter 1. And it really sets the tone, <coughs> excuse me, for what is going to follow. So we begin with these opening words. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now, the first thing we notice about this is we're looking at this idea of Word. In the beginning was the Word. That's the Greek word logos. Logos, meaning word, is, the, is the, the, that which comes forth from the mouth of God. And often when we look at this passage, we turn to the opening words of the Bible, where it is said, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, and it describes it, and he says, the, it just, the very first one, he says, and let there be light. And then there was light. It's the idea that the word goes forth, it is a declaration, and then it is accomplished. Because, as Isaiah says, the word goes forth that goes forth from my mouth accomplishes that 
for which I have sent it. So as we look at that, we see, okay, the word has the ability to do it. In the beginning was the word. Now I say, because in Jewish tradition, the Torah, T-O-R-A-H, which means teaching or instructions, um, they believe that the Torah is eternal. And likewise, we see this here. So I think you could say, in the beginning was the Torah. In the beginning was the instruction. In the beginning was the teaching. In the beginning was this way of laying out God's will for the universe, for life, and all of that. So it says now that in the beginning was the word. Okay, So that's that word, that declaration that comes from God's mouth and from God's mind. And the word was with God, of course, right? And the word was God. Now, this is a very important declaration. So what we're starting out here from the very beginning is the notion that this aspect of God, this word that goes forth, is with God from the beginning and shares in God's divinity. Now, I think it would be a stretch to go and then, of course, say that, you know, we're going to come up with the very detailed um, description of what the word means as we look at, for example, at the Nicene Creed or the Council of Chalcedon, which uh, um, in, in the Chalcedonian definition of Christ and the, and the full humanity and full divinity and all of that kind of thing. I think the antecedents are here, but understand that that's a much later development that is more, and it's in response to other things that are going on. This is just this, begin with this notion that here we have this word that is divine, that goes forth from the mouth of God to engage in certain activities. And then we get this. This word was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him. And without him was not anything made that was made. In him, in this word, was life. And that life was the light of man, the light of humanity. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. So now we're moving from the idea of word as creative. What does it create? It creates life. So here you go, you have the word that goes forth, it creates life, and in fact, it is this word with the creative and the light that brings light to the world. The world is in darkness naturally, but now as it is brought forth, as life is brought forth, we have light as well. So we have these three now notions. We have word, we have life, and we have light. Okay. Now, we're going to have an excursus here because we're going to talk about this guy who was sent from God, and that's John the Baptist. But I want to jump down to verse 14, and then we'll go back to looking at John uh, in another day. And the word, okay, let's go back to when we say this word. You've heard this many, many times. The word became flesh. We just kind of throw it out. But again, think about what this is. This word that was in the beginning with God, this word that was with God, this word that was God, this word that has brought life into the world through its creative activity, everything that has been made in the world was made through the word, the word that goes forth from God's mouth and mind and being, this word which has life in it, and this life is the light of humanity. The, this light which shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not, uh, sometimes it says understood or overcome it. This word, I think of all that I've just said, has taken on flesh. The word became flesh. That word for flesh is incarnate. And if you hear carnate, think of carnivore. A carnivore is a flesh-eating creature, right? But as we think of incarnate, 
That means infleshed, taking on our existence, our flesh, our being. And he has tabernacled among us. Now that word, uh, it's also said dwelt among us. I like the word tabernacled because immediately any Jewish person who read these words, and of course, that's their context, that's their understanding. So when John writes, he writes from that perspective. That word tabernacle automatically associates itself with the temple, with the Holy of Holies, with the tabernacle, the tent of meeting that was carrying uh, with the people as they made their journey out of Egypt and into the promised land. This was the place of God's dwelling. This is where God's glory resided on earth. <clears throat> this is the place where you came to meet with God. Now, it's not that you know, it's not that you could not meet God anywhere else, but this is the idea that as we come together and centering, and, and by the way, in the wilderness journeys, as they're making their pilgrimage from um, Egypt, escaping from Egypt and going to the promised land, the, the tabernacle is always in the midst of the people. So there they are in the midst of the people, this tabernacle, this dwelling place of God, the, the glory of God resides there. And so this word that we said with all these wonderful qualities that is divine, that was with God from the beginning, that created everything, that is the light of humanity and the life of the world, has taken on flesh and the glory of God resides with us, tabernacles among us. And so we even hear this kind of reiterated when he says in, in verse 14, and we have beheld his glory, the glory of the only Son from the Father, or the glory of the only one from the Father, um, full of grace and truth. So this is really amazing, you know, this, this wonderful, powerful idea that we have beheld the glory of the Son of the Father, and so we're going to identify the word that was made flesh now as the son. So what do we see in all, in all of this? We see word, logos, teaching, that which comes from the mouth of God, the mind of God, the being of God. This word that was creative and powerful, that has brought life to the world, and thereby bringing light to humanity. The light is stronger than anything in the world. It, the world has not overcome it. The darkness has not overcome it. This word has taken on flesh and become one of us and tabernacled among us so that the glory of God may reside in our midst this one who comes and is identified now as the son of the father. We are going to see that this, of course, this word that has become flesh will be none other than the babe of Bethlehem, whom we say is the son of God, the savior of the world, the light of the world, the life of all. Let us pray. Oh, gracious God, we do give you thanks for this time, and especially we're thankful that we can look at the scriptures on this third day of Christmas. We pray that the meaning of Christmas, the true meaning of Christmas, would be in our hearts and minds always, as we understand that the greatest gift of all is the gift of the Word made flesh, even Jesus Christ our Lord, in whose name we pray. Amen. Good evening. Hope you had a Merry Christmas, by the way, and continue.